Perfect. Good to go. In this episode of The Can Do Way, I'm talking to Gerard O'Donovan, founder, CEO, director and master executive coach. Now, Gerard is the founder and CEO of the Noble Manhattan Group, Europe's premier and longest established professional coaching and coach training organisation. He's also the founder of the Alpha Group, the leading peer-to-peer group to help owners of SMEs in 21 countries, president of the IIC and M, the International Institute of Coaching and Mentoring, the world's leading accreditation body for professional coaches, chairman of the ICN, the International Coaching News, the world's largest coaching publication, director of the IRCM, which is the International Regulator of Coaching and Mentoring, Master Executive Coach working with C-level executives and owner of the coaching blog. Now, there's lots of presidents and directors and masters in there, and it's a wonderful, wonderful way to get started. And you've got some some really great accreditation (coughs) there. So welcome to the show today, Gerard. Oh, thank you. It's my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Beautiful, beautiful. So if we can take a short walk first through your life, Gerard, if you can give the listeners a glimpse of your background and how you arrived at uh, being the coach that you are today. Okay, well, thank you. I'll, I'll keep it succinct. Um, <laughs> no, nothing unusual. I, I'm, it's a name like O'Donovan. It will come as no surprise to find out that I'm Irish. I grew up in a very small town in Southern Ireland. Uh, my father died when I was 11, so I started my work in life at 11 to support my family. Um, we moved to Scotland shortly after, about three years later, finished my schooling in Scotland, uh, and then joined the military, joined the Royal Marines, and spent nine years in the Royal Marine Commandos. I came out, I joined the insurance world, um, right at the bottom. I mean, you couldn't get more. It was commission only, cold calling, right at the the base level, uh, found it incredibly tough, made no money at all for about five months, almost starving. Um, then I, I started to learn how to do it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, started to do okay, uh, did well, did very successful in that industry, then set up my own company called Noble Manhattan Financial Services, grew that to becoming, at that time, the largest finan- privately owned financial services company. Today. We had about a thousand people working for us. Um, sold that to a company called Allianz, big international insurance company. And then I went into personal development in 1993. Because although I didn't really love insurance, what I loved was working with the people and helping the people to build and grow and become managers and look after their teams. And, and, and so, so I loved that part of it, not the actual insurance system sense um so i i went into personal development um very small just me on my own running it basically from a bedroom in my house um running courses on attitude power of the mind presentation skills goal achievement this type of thing and in london uh, i don't live in london i live quite a few hours away on the south coast but we i i i paid for a stand at an exhibition called um, Olympia, big exhibition center. Um, and there was a show called The Vitality Show. And I had a stand there for three days. <clears throat> and on the second day, I, I asked one of my team to just look after the stand. And I went for a coffee, walk, walking around the expedition, exhibition. And I walked past a lecture hall. And as I walked past, someone opened the door to come out. So I heard a voice speaking. And it was an American voice. Learned later, a, a lady called Laura Berman Fort, Fortgang, coach from New York. And I slipped in and just stood at the back and listened. And she was talking about this thing called life coaching. And this was right in the early days, you know, 1995. Um, people had never heard of coaching. And I just stood at the back and listened and listened and thought, oh, my goodness, this is, this is perfect. This is w- w- just what I am uh, aiming to do. So I waited and waited. She finished her talk. Everyone goes up and spoke to her, and she was selling books and in those days CDs. And I just waited and waited until everyone had gone. She was on her own. 
And I went up and gave her my card and asked for hers and said, I'm, I'd love to find out more. And that was the beginning of my journey. Mm -hmm. And I ended up doing three different courses, all with American companies. There was nothing in Europe back then. I gave myself a year to train, 95 to 96, did three different courses. And then I started to coach and, and just coach and coach and coach. Um, and of course, back then, people didn't understand coaching. You'd say I was a coach and people would say, does your coach have toilets on board? You know? <laughs> and and uh, they were thinking motor coach and, and how much is it from London to Birmingham? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was really pioneering days. And I just spent three years coaching, coaching, coaching daily, um, learning my trade, doing my apprenticeship, I guess, uh, racking up hundreds and, and hundreds of hours of practice. Um, and then in 1999, stroke 2000, just over the year break, uh, I, I started to train. So, um, and we've been training coaches now for 22 years. We've trained over 25,000. So, so that's it. A, a short synopsis. <laughs> that's it in a nutshell. No, that's that's a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all of that. You know, that thread of can do <clears throat> comes through straight away. You know, you, you started out in one place, you moved to another place, you moved to Scotland, you went into the Royal Marines, and then you stepped into the world of insurance, and then you discovered um, the, the the world of um, personal development and then on to life coaching and as you've said on to training as well and I think there's a, there's a very strong thread through there of being willing to see life as an adventure and I know before we came on air um, this afternoon Gerard we were talking about my adventure of living here in Malaysia and I think your life has been a big adventure as well so where do you feel that that adventurous spirit stemmed from in you? Um, your childhood, a role model, perhaps? Where did it come from? Um, probably a couple of things. Um, I'm an avid reader. And since a young age, I just love to read about travel. Travel is something I love to do. It broadens the mind. It's so exciting. So I've always wanted to travel, to explore. Um, I've loved reading about famous people from history who have done magnificent things. Um, so these were my sort of role models. Um, and this is big, when I was very young, um, before I came across the great motivators of today, like Brian Tracy and Jim Rowan and Zig Ziglar and Tony Robbins and, and all of those people, I'd never heard of them mm. when I was a child. Um, and later when I got into the insurance industry, I came across those great men and women started to, read their books and listen to their audios um, about, you know, being successful and taking risks and expanding and, and trying things and being, being, being willing to have a go. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I guess the big one is being willing to fail and fail badly, not, not feel bad about it. You, you will know, of course, being a master coach, there are, People are held back by a number of fears. Um, the fear of rejection is a huge mm -hmm. thing. The fear of failure is the big one. And strangely enough, the fear of success. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough. So I, 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 I sort of made a mental note many years ago that I would try. And you don't always succeed. So, but, you know, you, you try. It's, it's a journey. I, I would try and, and overcome the fear of rejection and the fear of failure. And of course, you never quite do, but it's it's a journey. You just get better at it. Indeed, indeed, it's part of the adventure, as you said. You know, the the reading takes you into um, another realm, doesn't it? Because it inspires curiosity. It inspires so much thinking about possibilities as well. And I, <clears throat> I guess that feeds and fed well into you becoming a coach. And and as you said back in nineteen ninety two, you were you you transferred your focus from being on the insurance to more about the people and so being curious about where that could take you as well that's that's clearly evident in the path that you have taken so 
on your journey of going through these different roles in your life to get to where you are today, what would you say was one of the biggest challenges for you? And what did you do to be able to manage that challenge in order to to start to learn how to thrive and to continue to thrive up to present day? I, I think there's always challenges, right? There, there's always challenges, cash flow, money, time, um, resources. These are, I would class them as uh, secondary challenges. You have to overcome the primary challenge first, which is your belief in yourself that you can do it. And that that is a challenge. So when you come up with an idea, um, you come up with this idea and you think, oh, yes, I'd love to do that. And then you start to have the negative thoughts. But, <laughs> but how could I? I don't know anything. I Other people are so much better. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the result. So I find the big challenge is sitting down and overcoming the initial doubts, the initial fears that rise up as blockages to stop you taking those steps. Mm -hmm. And coming back to uh, reading, um, I I, I get a huge inspiration from studying and reading. Um, And I guess I can say now publicly, you know, I can come out and say, I am a bookaholic. (laughs) I'm not I'm not an alcoholic I'm not a chocoholic but I am a bookaholic Mm -hmm. and I I think it's a disease I I cannot walk past the bookshop without (laughs) going in Um, and and my wife has has literally banned me from buying more books you know (laughs) but I have Kindle now so I can have hundreds Mm -hmm. of books on my and she doesn't know about them (laughs) (laughs) without it because I have you can see I have books behind me, but you can't see the floor around my desk. Mm. I don't have a filing system. I have a piling system, <laughs> piles of books, you know, and by my bedside table and mm. books everywhere. Yes. So so I get great inspiration from reading. And and I, I, someone told me many years ago, I think it was Jim Rowan, one of my early mentors, he said, imagine, imagine if someone goes through a most extraordinary experience for five years in their life and they write a book and you can learn about it in five days. Imagine that. So you can you can draw on the experience of all these great men and women mm-hmm. and what they've gone through and the lessons that they have learned. So, yeah, I would encourage people to be a, a bookaholic. It's indeed, indeed. And it's one addiction that I share with you as well, because I, I consider myself a self-confessed book addict and a, I voraciously read across genres. And it's not just always business books, but I, I love to dive deep into biographies and and, um, and fiction stories as well, because, you know, you just have to step away um, and step into somebody else's imagination from time to time, because it's just a wonderful place. Um, to refresh your thinking and also just, just to just to learn, as you say. It's all about learning and, and then what you can do with that learning and how you can bring that into your, your day-to-day life and you can bring it into the relationships you have with others and also, as you and I do, bring it into our coaching as well. Um, and, and we learn all of the tools, the techniques, the tips and all of those strategies. Um, we borrow and we share and, and that is that really helps all of our clients to to become who they were born to be. So um, I share your passion for reading most definitely. <laughs> so when you when you uh, made some of the changes as well, just to to strengthen that real can do mindset of yours for the listeners, is you went from Royal Marine to insurance, from insurance to personal development, and then into the world of life coaching again and into training. What would be one of the biggest risks you think that you took from changing careers and what did you learn from it as a result? Um, At one point in the um, mid-90s, I lost everything, Mm -hmm. literally everything. I had done very well. I had made over a million. I was a millionaire in the insurance world. Um, sold it, um, 
and then lost everything, made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. um, lost my house, my car. I mean, literally everything went down to zero um, and had to start again. And one of the, the big things is overcoming this, the doubt that you could do it. Um, and how would you do it? And how do you start with literally zero? Um, um, and when you have big ideas, you have big dreams, but literally zero assets, zero resources. Um, and it, 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 it builds within you this fear, this abject fear. Um, and I often talk about what it's like to be an entrepreneur. And this is why I love entrepreneurs. When I coach, although I coach people across all genres and I love it, I love spiritual coaching, but I love working with business owners mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs because they know what it's like to wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning in a cold sweat, in, in an abject fear, knowing that when the morning comes, you have this big problem or problems to deal with, mm -hmm. and you don't want the morning to come, mm -hmm. but it's going to come. Um, and entrepreneurs know what it's like to have to deal with that and to build, grow, expand on sometimes on nothing. You know? um, so overcoming that sort of situation, and when you feel like that, it's not just mental, it's not just emotional, it's physical, it affects you physically. Uh, you've often heard the saying, people get sick to their stomach, mm -hmm. um, you know. So it's overcoming that and having the, the absolute belief it, deep down that you can do this, whatever it is this is, whatever it is you've set your mind to, you just know in your heart, you know, I can do this. And whatever I'm facing now, these are blockages on the way, and these will make me stronger. And, and again, and this, it, this is stupid, really, but, you know, people pl I play, people play games with themselves and with the mind. And, and I would say to myself, this is only temporary. Mm -hmm. um, this is something the universe is placing in front of me just to test me, just to make sure I'm worthy of, of whatever lies at the other end of this mm -hmm. obstacle. Mm -hmm. And because you don't know if that's the truth, but this is what I would tell myself uh, to keep myself going. And what I found and still do find is taking time to be on your own is, I would, I would use the word crucial, um, just quiet time, thinking time, um, you, you time or me time, whatever word you want to use, um, not focusing on business, not focusing, just quiet time to be on your own mm -hmm. with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and just stare out to sea for half an hour a day. Although it sounds a bit silly, that I find is hugely mm -hmm. effective um, in helping to give you the, um, the mental strength, the emotional strength, the, uh, the ideas that then come. Mm -hmm. And whenever I have these problems, um, I just go and spend time on my own for half an hour, yeah, stare out to sea, have a coffee, and ideas always come. They mm. always come. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think your message is so very clear. And you, you mentioned before about the fact that failure is one of those challenges that we often see in our coaching work, Gerard, that, that people are, they fear failure. And yet you, failed at this hurdle in your life and you but your message to me and I'm sure the listeners will take this too is the way you've come back from it and built the resilience that you have to this day that it's actually okay to fail and that you can pick yourself up and you know how to focus your mindset your thinking your self-talk all of those key elements to say to yourself this is what's happened, this is the reality, but this is what I can do about it. And that the fact that, as you said, I can do it. This is These are those critical, critical words that I'm hearing from you. I just wanted to ask, though, in amongst all of it, is there one particular anchor that really is your go-to when you are facing 
the toughest challenge that you have ever faced? Is there some one thing that you do that really helps you to get to that other side, to get back into the light, um, away from the darkness? A couple of things, really. Um, yes. I, I find quiet meditation mm -hmm. is ever so. But for me, this is, I'm not saying this is right for everyone. But for me, quiet meditation, I find, is very helpful. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. The other thing I find is exercise. Um, go for a run, go to the gym. Doing something hard and physical, which takes my mind off of the problem that I'm currently facing because of the nature of what you're doing. Uh, it, it, it forces you to not think about what you're uh, worried about. Mm -hmm. And that I find is very, very beneficial. So even today, I still exercise every single day. Mm -hmm. I, I find it very, well, actually very enjoyable. But when things are tough, I find it very helpful. Mm -hmm. And then just to have this... You know, you've got different levels. You've got your conscious, you've got your unconscious. And all of these problems are coming in at the conscious level. Mm -hmm. But to somehow have at the unconscious level a total belief in your own ability to overcome. So you, you just know that deep down, no matter what is thrown at you, you will come up with a solution. So having that underpinning everything, even though at times you have no idea, you cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. You just know that you will. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was in the Royal Marines, we we had a saying. We were told we were almost indoctrinated with the saying, <laughs> and, and with many actually. But one has stuck in stuck with me forever, and it's your mind is a weapon. You know, and I was told that when I was 18 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's true. Your mind is a weapon and you can use it to protect yourself and to achieve whatever you want. Mm. Indeed, indeed. You can take that any way, really. You need to look after it. You need to nurture it. But you can also explore with it as well. It's it's such a powerful, powerful part of us. And I really like those three anchors um, for for the listeners to take away, as you said, that solo time that you believe is crucial um, to your life and, and yes. how you live. But yeah. that meditation is just the quietness, the silence. And as you say, even if it's just staring out to sea or sitting in a forest or sitting in a room, just in quiet, reflective meditation. And I, I share your your joy of exercise as well. It's something I do every single day. It's a sacred space for me as well. And it just powers you up so much and it really helps you to set that intention. I, but sorry, go on. It does. Are we going to say there, there's something else? In the world of coaching, we talk mm. a lot about values. Values mm. are important. They underpin everything we do, our core values. But there's another word you, you don't hear very often. In fact, I'm over, I've almost never heard it. And, and I talk to my people about it a lot. I say, you should have values mm -hmm. and let's work out what your values are and what's important to you. But you should have spirit. What is your spirit? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I worked out many years ago what my spirit is. Um, and I, if, I, if it's okay, I'll share it. But, um, Please. And there are three. Um, number one, you know, the, the spirit of courage, having courage having the courage to get out in front and never giving up. Um, number two, having the spirit of unselfishness. Uh, you should always put others first. And um, I remember I, I heard Zig Ziglar a long time ago, wonderful motivation speaker. And he had a wonderful phrase. He taught this, he said, and people get this wrong. People always misquote it. You can get anything you want out of life by helping enough other people get what they want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that's what most people think. But that's not all of it. There's another word at the end. And it should be, you can get anything you want out of life by helping enough other people get what they want first. 
True. They have mm-hmm. to come first. Mm-hmm. Most people forget that last little bit. So you have to help others first. So having a spirit of unselfishness, mm-hmm. and I have a I have a list of priorities. You know, my my family, followed by my friends, followed by my my team and my colleagues. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and lastly, having the spirit of cheerfulness. Very important. And again, this is just my attitude. Mm-hmm. Having the spirit of cheerfulness, making humor the heart of your morale. So no matter how difficult things are, finding the ability to laugh about it mm-hmm. uh, and crack a joke. So, you know, I often say to people, we know your values now. We've worked on those. But what is your spirit? Yes. It's a wonderful yeah, additional question. Important. Wonderful additional question to be to be asking any client because, yes, the values are the ones that matter. But it's what makes you tick and what other people see, isn't it? That that makes that spirit come to life um, in all your interactions and and who you are when you're with yourself, um, as much as when you're with other people as well. So. Given that we're at this stage that I ask for the the your three can do tips that you'd like to share, how would you what would you like to summarize as your three say life mantras or the tips, even though so you've shared stick, a I number have to of keep things? The three, do I? Yes, please. If you can just share three, I'm sure you have many, many, many over the years that you've been working, Gerard. All right. So I would recommend that. Okay, let me preface it. There are two types of coaches in the world, and I'm using that just for the basis of this Mm -hmm. discussion. The good and the successful. What is quite annoying is that the good are not always successful. Mm -hmm. And what is rather frustrating is that the successful are not always good. Mm -hmm. What they are good at is marketing. So to be a great and successful coach, you need to have great coaching skills, abilities, techniques, and so on but also the ability to build and grow your business. Mm -hmm. So my tip number one is I would recommend that everyone studies marketing. Uh, Because everything we do in life is about marketing yourself, your ability, your knowledge, your business, and so on. So Mm -hmm. study marketing. Don't panic about it. Don't worry about it. Take your time, read the books, watch the videos, but study marketing. Number two You absolutely, positively have to treat your body well. Um, And by that, I mean getting the right food, exercise and sleep. Mm -hmm. And the three go together. You know, if you deny yourself one of those, it's going to affect you and it will catch up. And there is no plan B. There is no second body. You don't have another. So you've got to get the right sleep. You've got to eat properly. And an exercise. Um, And then the third tip I'd have would be spend time alone on your own each day. Doesn't have to be long, 20 minutes. Away from the phone, away from your laptop, um, away from electronics, uh, away from other people. Um, Take a book, sit in a cafe, have a coffee, stare out to sea, stare at the street, watch people go by. But just spend time a little bit, 20, 30 minutes on your own every day. Mm -hmm. When I go, I take a notebook and a pen. Always. And ideas just. So those would be my three little bits of guidance. And they're fabulous as well. Absolutely fabulous. Um, And they they sum up everything that you've talked about uh, in today's conversation as well Gerard so my last question for you on the show is why do you feel a can-do attitude is absolutely essential okay I remember someone once said to me you can achieve anything in life that you want with a positive mental attitude then he paused and he said better than with a negative mental attitude so what is the alternative what is the alternative um, and we have a choice. Let's not forget, we actually have the power of choice. We can choose whether to be positive or negative, whether to have a can do or I cannot do. Mm-hmm. You know. And again, I know time is running out. Some people, when presented with a situation, say, why? Other people say, why me? And other people say, why not me? 
why not me? And um, that's what I would recommend people. Find when you look at someone achieving something, you should say to yourself, why not me? Yeah. Love it. That's a fantastic way to to bring to a close. Um, I've really enjoyed our conversation for the last half hour, and I'm sure it's inspired a lot of thought um, and maybe some different ways of thinking about how people can just tweak their mindset um, to have more of that can-do spirit and that can-do drive in their everyday interactions, their relationships, and in the work or career that they do as well. So thank you so much for being my guest today on The Can Do Way. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.